community that they just built for people mm -hmm. to be able to move into. Um, what is the water ceremony? What is so I don't know where that picture is from specifically. It says 2022 water ceremony. I have no idea maybe what they were doing okay. out there, but, and I don't know, I can't tell if that looks like the Lumber River, if there's somewhere else. Okay, it's fine. I was just <laughs> curious. Fair question. This is so cool. I noticed that y'all's jewelry is so like beautiful. Is this stones? I can't see exactly what he has on. It kind of, it looks like it. Um, so like we, and like a lot of other like tribes and uh, that part of like the country, like we're kind of Eastern woodland natives. Um, so some of like our regalia and some of our jewelry and stuff is similar to what you'll find from other tribes in the area. Um, and so like in North Carolina, there's Lumbee, there's Kohari, there's Wakamasuan, Halawasaponi, uh, Okanichi, uh, and then we also have the Eastern Band Cherokee, um, and they're federally recognized, so they're the only federally recognized group in the state. Um, who am I forgetting? Yes, and we're all kind of spread out a little bit, but... What about place names? Because I know there's so many, like, Native American... Um, tribal names that are attached to places mm -hmm. is that kind of true in North Carolina yeah as well? and I know that like some of those tribes are currently not where their homelands are mm -hmm. um, and I don't remember for like all of them like where exactly that is um, but like for us like we like our life has been kind of sustained in that area by the Lumber River so mm -hmm. that's where like Lumbee comes from mm -hmm. um, and it is like a Blackwater River um, and so um, that's water that like you know I have not spent a lot of time with but like for so many of my family members that was a place of like community like that's where they would go in like the summertime and like learn how to swim and like um, but yes our name is definitely connected to mm. this place yeah I love it I love looking at the slideshow. Yeah. It's They've been like updating the website, making some changes. Great questions yeah. though. I appreciate you asking them. What else are you curious about? I think you made a really good point that um, native cultures are living cultures. Yeah. Oftentimes people want to like put us in museums, yeah. you know, just keep it like this very static mm -hmm. kind of culture, like you belong in the past. Yeah. You know, and so that's sometimes some you know problematic mm -hmm. um you know to say hey we're here we've been here a long time <laughs> mm -hmm. we're still here you know and so not to try to like stereotype culture as something that's not living evolving right. transforming as it should mm -hmm. yeah and i think a lot of people too when i meet them kind of have this um you'll hear it called like a pan indian identity where like they just kind of know that like, you know, natives are a thing, but like they have kind of the same idea of what like all of us look like, mm -hmm. what, yeah. where all of us live. Um, and I know for a lot of people, like they'll meet me and they'll ask me like what percent I am, I think because for a lot of them, they see like my curly hair mm -hmm. and they're confused because like for a lot of people, they're so used to seeing like someone with like very straight, dark black right. hair. And like for Lumbies, like this is like, you know, a very typical hair texture. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just that, but, like, I'll also have people that are, like, confused about, um, and these are, like, fair misconceptions because of, you know, what people are informed about or taught about mm -hmm. um, from very early ages about Native people. You know, mm -hmm. I meet people that, like, are, like, you're the first Native person I've ever met in my life and will have ideas about, like, how we live. That was a lot different also when I was, like, really young, and I'd have classmates who'd be, like, your grandparents like live in like a house mm -hmm. or like just like questions like that where they just kind of did not know um, there's so much tropes yeah i mean yeah. there's these, these stereotypes they get passed down yeah. to the generations and yeah and i think some people too like uh when they hear that like we don't have our language anymore are very surprised but like that's not an uncommon thing oh, and it is so like un yeah you also have to think about kind of the um period of time that we were first introduced to like European settlers mm -hmm. like it started very 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 early right. um, 
and that part of the country. And so that's something where for a lot of people I've had to kind of like sit them down and be like, actually, no, like it makes sense why Mm -hmm. um, we're missing some of those parts of like our history. But like that does not mean that we are still aren't like connected to this area or that we still aren't creating our like current day identity and like Mm -hmm. our current culture, you know? Yeah. So, like, that first encounter was what, like, what, the 1300s, 1400s? Um, um, something like that. Something like that. Yeah. That's hundreds of years. Yeah. Yeah. And so, like, I'll say, too, like, I've mentioned that I have a lot of family members who teach. And part of that kind of goes back to the history of, like, you know, a lot of Lumbee families, like, uh, they were sharecroppers. They didn't own the land that they were living on. And when it came to, like, education like Lumbees taught Lumbee children mm. essentially so like it makes sense that like I had a lot of family members who were school teachers and um uh the University of uh North Carolina at Pembroke like started out as like a teacher's college to prepare like native teachers to go teach like native students oh, in the wow. area yeah so like a long kind of standing um focus on education and um, so yes, I still have a lot of teachers <laughs> in nice. my family. So is that kind of like a tribal college? Uh, uh no. Or no? Uh, not necessarily a tribal college. A very large population of Native students, mm-hmm. um, and like a history kind of connected to the tribe. So like homecoming pretty much takes place on UNCT's campus. Um, so for people that go there, some of them like, uh, have no idea anything like about the area and they get mm-hmm. there and are like immediately kind of immersed in like lumbies nice so so yeah. would you say that the majority of the students on campus are native or lumbies? um or? i don't know about majority a lot of students like commute and don't always like live on campus but there are students that i know like you know come in for a specific program or major or come in maybe to like play sports mm-hmm. um but a super high population of Lumbee students specifically. Um, I actually don't know about, like, the representation of other Native students from, like, other tribes in the state. Um, But it's a school that's, like, right there at home. It's one of the cheapest, like, tuitions in the state Mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. students to go to. Um, But, yeah. Yeah, But you didn't... Did you go with that? You didn't. You went to Appalachian Mm -hmm. State. Yeah, and that's something where I had a lot of family members who were like come home come yeah. home you can come and do laundry at my house <laughs> um and I part of the reason why I went to app was just because of like the specific teaching program mm-hmm. um because I have a chemistry degree with a concentration in secondary education and like at a lot of universities like that kind of doesn't exist like I would have had to get my science degree and then go get like a teaching license yeah kind of separately mm-hmm. and um it's Yes, they offered a program, essentially, that had what I wanted in terms of teaching and the science, um, and they offered me, like, a lot of scholarships and have, um, like, a teacher prep program that's very defined because there used to be, um, oh, what's it called? Um, I cannot remember the name of the program. I think teaching fellows, I don't, I cannot remember, but it was something that kind of helped uh, people pay for college and was like a very tight knit community for pre-service teachers, Mm -hmm. like throughout college. Um, And this was kind of something that uh, existed on Appalachian's campus that like I did not find in a lot of other schools. Mm -hmm. So like that's what really kind of drew me in to go in there. That's so cool, but that you didn't have to leave your own state. Yeah. To get the kind of education And I also, like, we had just moved back to North Carolina. I finished, like, half of my junior year and senior year. And we were living previously in, like, Alabama. So there was, like, I was applying to schools all over Alabama, Texas, and North Carolina. And it was kind of a little bit of a fight for me to get in-state tuition. Because, like, technically we had not lived there, Mm. like, long enough. Um, But, like, that's, like, home, kind of Mm -hmm. our home base Mm -hmm. always. So... Yes. I noticed that the powwow for fall 2023 is when we come back from the... Yeah, on the 28th. Yeah, 20 yeah, September 29th, 30th, and October 1st. 
$10 for adults. Children under five are free. Yeah, and I think for a lot of people, five dollars. Um, they'll like throw around the word powwow to mean like, let's go sit down and have a powwow to mean like a meeting. And I don't think a lot of people know that like this is like, yes, it's dancing. Yes, it's community, but this also like it's a competition. Dance contest, it's, drum contest. Yeah. Like it's it's a competition. Um, Wait, what is, I see men's, ver men's fancy versus women's fancy. So there are different like, styles of oh. like the dancing and that also kind of determines the regalia so there will be people that compete in like the men's fancy category women's fancy jingle dress dancers um and then there are also like drum circles that will this compete is crazy too. the so drum yes. contest it says the first place winner wins eight thousand dollars yes so i think a lot of people don't know how <laughs> competitive it is very competitive so like when i said like powwow circuit like uh once kind of a season begins people will like travel across the state to other states to like participate um yes and it can also be like quite expensive to participate in like regalia is not cheap to make um or to like maintain um but yes i'm a little sad because i'm missing like so many powwows specifically for this month it says men's chicken special for mm -hmm head male mm -hmm. what does what does that mean that's another dance and oh, so it's like a dance okay. yeah when you like typically uh there will be like a head male dancer head female dancer that's yeah. kind of like announced ahead of yes. time um and then like something else too like this summer um i saw a lot of people talking about like how hot it was during homecoming this year to the point where it's like it's not like safe to kind of have like you know some of our elders out there to like people didn't some people didn't go this year because of like how hot it was getting um so when we think about like some of our like traditions and stuff like those things are allowed to like you know change as like time moves on so that's yeah so that's something where i foresee um maybe changing in the future a little mm -hmm. bit is like what time of year so this time of year is like very popular for like powwows because this is like hot is uh, is it harvest season of any type or is there anything going on environmentally like gathering of food or so corn is like a really big staple nowadays and also that's something that like when i was doing that project i did not realize how much like crops had changed um like tobacco mm -hmm. cotton mm -hmm. uh we're really big crops not tobacco as much anymore and like my parents' generation, I don't know how many people in my generation, um, I did not, there probably are some people that grew up like cropping tobacco as like mm -hmm. their first job. Um, and that's something that I like never experienced, but like for my dad, like he would go and crop tobacco and that's how he'd get money to like get his school clothes, you mm -hmm. know? And I don't remember like what time of year exactly that would be, but like corn is kind of at like the beginning of summer. Um, and some of the corn will stay out long enough so that it'll like dry up and then they'll use that for like chicken feed. Um, and like agriculture has completely changed yeah. inside the county. There are a lot of like chicken farms, hog farms. Um, are those like, kind of like industrialized yeah. type? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so for a lot of people, that's why people were moving up north to like Baltimore and Detroit. Um, and there are, you know, where a lot of like factories that kind of moved in mm -hmm. to uh the area and so i have a lot of family members that like you know that's where they worked but yeah sounds very similar um to hawaii i can see a lot of correlations yeah 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 and a lot of times there are and i think that's something that's been very special about me is to just like um be here and then kind of listen and learn about some of the experiences that like y'all are having on the island and just kind of reminding me of like stuff that I see um and there's a lot that we like can learn from one another and like oh, absolutely. you know this take back cross-cultural exchanges like um it's just such an important part of connecting with other indigenous people and communities and really sharing those kind of shared values mm -hmm. understanding but then also seeing the differences but you know for me when I think about that like even th through Noah you know, we have so many indigenous communities who have deep relationships with these sanctuary sites. And we, as a federal government, need to 
understand that and elevate those mm. relationships because they're the best caretakers of these sites is the native people mm -hmm. like they've been doing this for millennia you know and so really like building those partnerships that are equitable you know that that it's not this very federal regulation type relationship but support how do we support yeah. what you're already doing because we're yeah. doing it already we've been doing it all this time yeah. so that's kind of what i get excited about yeah <laughs> and in working with noah and seeing how we can make those those relationships build those relationships yeah. and strengthen them definitely that's something that like i had not seen a lot of and like seen how that was done until i came out here and learned about the designation of the monument mm -hmm. and like the expansion of the monument and kind of like the future into looking at like what else yeah um, yeah and it come. really is very unique mm -hmm. when you think about it you know that that this is a really wonderful model for other um, places to kind of use adapt you know because it's going to be all place-based mm -hmm. and so just you know these are tools that have been developed that can help others you know with those relationship building the, the management the equity the sharing of power there's so much good yeah Yeah, we've got some time still. Yeah, so I'll, I'll also say that like when I was doing that project when I was a senior in high school, um, a lot of my research was like interviewing uh, different people but a lot of it was like I would sit down with my grandparents and just like ask them questions and stories about what it was like when they were growing up and for me that was like so eye-opening and that's something where like every time I go home and like see my Nana like I'll ask her to like take out her yearbooks and we'll just like flip through the pages and like I'll just ask her questions about like what was school like for you growing up like uh, opportunities for like work after high school um, kind of like family relations and things like that and like you know there's a lot have that have already like changed like within our community through generations that like you know without asking those questions I would not have ever like known about yeah it's so important to to do those kind of interviews with, yeah. our, with our elders because places change over time histories change over time and those kind of connections that are built in communities like for me are so strong mm -hmm. And you can't really go forward unless you know where you come from. You yeah. know, as as a Kanako Evie, we're always looking to the past to inform the future. And so um, we actually created an ethnography school in um, the North Shore. So we developed this school to train the next generation of college students mm -hmm. on, um, you know, culturally grounded methodologies to to record and document community history especially um, Kanako or Ivi history wow and so the students we train them um, we worked really closely with community partners like the um, Hawaiian Civic Clubs um, to like identify which one of the kupuna we wanted to interview mm -hmm. and so we had all our students we had the first cohort we had about 15 graduate students uh, graduate and undergrads and it was amazing. Wow. I mean, this was just a, all about building relationships. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't exploitive research where we come in, we get your interview, and then we leave. 
Um, we wanted these students to build these relationships so they maintain them over time mm -hmm. with the community and with the elders. So beautiful. We made story maps and we had them interview them, video, videotape them, hang out with them. Like yeah. on Saturdays, we hang out, we have lunch. You know, the, the elders would invite some of the students into their homes. Mm -hmm. So it was amazing. It was yeah. just an amazing project. So that was a three-year project, um, ethnography um, field school that was developed. So, you know, it's like kupuna and community histories are so important. And if we don't document them, they pass and their story is gone with them. Yeah. So we were so lucky because several of the um, kupuna passed and their families were so thrilled that they had this legacy piece mm -hmm. to show their, the next generations. Because you'd never know, you know, yeah. unless you interview them and get their stories of their lives and their places they are associated with, the kind of work they did. So rich. Wow. Such a rich, rich um, engagement. That's amazing to hear about. I think too, like, um, like for me, because like I never went to school like in the county, I never participated in like the Indian education uh, kind of like curriculum in the area. Um, and so like, there is a podcast called the Red Justice Podcast that looks at like missing and murdered Indigenous mm -hmm. women, mm -hmm. specifically in Robeson County, and I literally saw on y'all's page that y'all have it for missing and 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 oh geez, I can't pronounce it. Yeah, missing and in, murdered indigenous yes, people. indigenous people. And I was gonna ask you about that, but yeah. go ahead, keep talking, sorry. No, no, you're I'm, good. I'm currently reading all of the history and culture that they have. Yeah, dig so into it. So highly suggest going to the lumbytribe.com yes. and going to their history and culture and they literally, it's just one page. Per topic? Yeah. yeah per topic and it's it's really it's oh, I'm I learning a lot getting educated awesome. yeah yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm letting you know I am listening to whatever you're saying no, but I'm yeah. also reading no I appreciate that because you're good at multitasking <laughs> yes I am yes, yes I am no I love that I have people you know that will like ask me questions and stuff and I realize it's kind of a lot of pressure because I'm like you know I'm probably going to be the only person that yeah. they may meet from my yeah. people and you know I want to make sure not only am I just like representing well but like mm -hmm that, you know, this may also be, like, the last conversation that they may ever have about yeah. Lumbies or, like, know about us. So I just really appreciate that you, you know, easily just went to Google and typed in our name and found the website and started reading. Um, but, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so MMIW is kind of, you know, I think a lot of people will see that thrown around, like, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. It's kind of expanded into Missing and Murdered, like, Indigenous people. Mm -hmm. But in Robeson County, there are, like so many stories um and like stories that I kind of grew up hearing um but there's a podcast that was started by like these two Lumbee women that wanted to highlight like not just Lumbee stories like a lot of them are in Robeson County mm -hmm. and like surrounding areas and like other tribes in the state but like they'll also tell stories about like other peoples like throughout like the country um but like listening to that specifically I heard so many stories about like wait a second I kind of remember this from when I was young. I just, like, mm -hmm. forgot about it. Or certain stories about, like, the 80s or the 90s in the county where I was, like, listening to it being, like, these were the times, like, my parents were here and they were young. And, like, you know, before I was here, that I've just, like, never heard this history of um, the county mm -hmm. or the culture. And so, like, that has been kind of eye-opening for me and has also started a lot of conversation about, like, wait a second, what happened? How come no one's ever told me this right, history before? Right. Um, and so, like, one piece of Lumbee history that people are, like, really proud of and, like, talk about a lot, um, there was something called the Battle of Hayes Pond. I don't know if you've, like, found it yet on the website, but um, there was a group, I guess, I don't know how to call them, of, like, KKK members that mm -hmm. were kind of moving into the area. Oh, I think you might be muted. <laughs> So, yes, so they have rooting the KKK, but I haven't gotten to it yet. Okay. I'm on the Keep third. Going. Keep going. I'm on naming the people. Okay. That's where I'm at. Okay, yes, yeah, so you'll get there. But yes. Yes. Um, and what time period was this? Uh, 
Hannah, correct me if I'm wrong, 60s? I'll, I'll tell you right now. I believe it was 60s, maybe 50s. So during the Civil Rights Movement? Yeah, and so um, I explained that like this area is unique in North Carolina because it was like tri-racially segregated. Um, 1958. 58. Tri-racially separated. Yeah, because like we have never been on like a reservation, but uh -huh. like you know there were white people in the county, Lumbees in the uh -huh. county, um, black people in the county. And so like when it comes to like schools, right. like they were separate schools. Really? Yeah. Oh. So like for my grandparents, I think once I sat down and started asking them questions, I was like, wait a second. I've never heard about that being like in other parts of the country, which I'm sure oh. there are. But yes, 58. Oh, I'm, I'm literally reading about. When separate schools were established for black and white children in 1875, no provision was made for Indians. Yeah. The ensuing struggles to ascertain education for their children while maintaining their identity as Indian people starkly highlighted the Indians' need for political autonomy. A formal name became necessary to achieve this autonomy and to negotiate with local, state, and federal governments. Mm -hmm. So, like, for a while, like, we kind of had, like, no recognition and kind mm -hmm. of, like, existed in that space always. Um, and then when it kind of came down to, like, there are separate schools, um, th then it kind of became a need to be like, wait a second, like, we have an identity here, yeah. like a specific but culture But it seems here. that you folks had a very good leadership because that wouldn't have happened unless yeah. you had some awesome leaders yeah. who are leading that charge. Yeah, so back to Battle of Hayes Pond, 1958, um, there's kind of word that came in. There's a town called Maxton. Um, that there were going to be people that came in and, like, you know, guns, raid, mm. like, um, and, like, a bunch of lums found out about it and showed up <laughs> and met them Good with them. a bunch of people. Mm. So, like, if you go and look at pictures, you'll see, like, these lumpy men with, like, these huge KKK flags because they, like, you know, turned them around and, like, mm -hmm. took everything that they had and mm -hmm. um, kept them from coming in. And That's how you stand up for your community. Yeah, and that's something, oh. too, where even in that story, like, there were Lumbee women there that, like, I never hear them, mm -hmm. like, being talked about yeah, and, like, kind yeah. of their role in that night because mm -hmm. it was kind of like, you know, this is happening. We need people to kind of come out and, like, you know, stop them. Right. Um, so well, that's maybe that's, that's a project for you to oh. go in and uh, reveal those women's yeah, stories. Yeah, I'll tell them you, standing strong my sister, then. she's at UNC Chapel Hill, and she's majoring in, like, uh, I forget the name exactly of the program, but like American Studies with a concentration, and um, I think they have it titled like American Indian Studies, something like that. So like she kind of, my family kind of jokes with her about like that's kind of what she's gonna yeah, be ending up yeah. doing. Sweet. Um, where uh, are people? Yes. I just so it's really interesting reading about like how your name like came yeah. around and how like. It was always the government that was naming you guys yeah. instead of, like, listening to you guys. So I see you see, like, the Cherokee Indians of Robinson yeah. County. And yeah. people, like, uh, let me word this right. Like, people kind of hear that and kind of think that, like, Lumbees were trying to, like, claim Cherokee. But yeah, it's, and no, like, they're not. not. <laughs> yes. they, it says they're... This name did not connote or comprise the true identity of the Robinson County Indians. And while they tried to change it, the name lasted for many years. Yeah. And then in 1953, which is crazy because it's been here for so long, was when they finally recognized their name, like the state government recognized them as their suited name. Hey, just a quick heads up. We're going to start recovery operations oh. in about 30 meters. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. You're good till then. Okay. Thank you. So... So yeah, I just I just finished reading now the name. Now I'm gonna go to the to my next, which is education. Yeah. I love this. See the more we know about, you know, history and, you know, people's experiences, you know, the broader our awareness goes and our understanding I think and our empathy, mm -hmm. you know, for what other people have had to go through. Yeah. So this is education, this is talking about the segregation, more in depth. Some Indian children received no formal education at all. Mm -hmm. So you're right, they had to teach themselves. Even so, all was not lost. The people focused on education with fever and achieved a remarkable success. The people recognized a need for educated Indian teachers for their Indian schools. Yeah, so this was before yeah. UNCP was UNCP, it was Croatan Normal Indian yes. School. Yes, Croatan. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
they said that that term t Croatan turned into a derogatory name. Mm -hmm. So that was another thing of then they changed it to the Cherokee mm -hmm. of and then that wasn't even that was not how it was. But yeah, it says in 1887 Macmillan sponsored legislation for Indian Normal School and the bill was passed and $500 was appropriated for to fund teacher salaries. Wow. I it did was not left, know 500. <laughs> yeah, it was left up to the Indians to secure, secure building funds and land for the school. So they did. Wow. And they built, it was called the Croatan Normal School, opened in the fall of 1887. That is awesome. Now yeah. think about the time wow. period, right? Yeah. 1887. Right? Yes. Americans, like, their literacy rates are not really that high, mm -hmm. right? I think Russia had, like, 17%, America, like, 30% to have a school open up. Yeah. And so that building, um, that's, like, the building where, like, my, like, Nana went to high school. My bridge, bridge, bridge school back and, deck, are we clear to um, continue the recovery? That you're looking at here now, Old Main. Right. Charlie to recover. UNTC. Starting our recovery. Okay. Thank you. Small fish in view. Nice sunset on wire. Shark. Herc is at the surface. Two sharks. Copy that. Herc at the surface.
is out of the water. Full van copies. Hey Jake, you think it's possible to hit those sharks with the scaling lasers? Atlanta's on deck. Roger that. Atlanta on deck.
Shark is out of the water. Firm, Herc is out of water. Voltage is secure. Copy that, high voltage is secure.